There we go. Awesome. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us live. This is Ann Carey Ford calling in from Ojai, California. Um, we've been having a few technical glitches this morning, just where I live, it's still morning. And um, if at some point you can't hear John, John figured out a way that if you can't hear me, I can still, well, if you can't hear us, please put in the chat that you can't hear us. And I'll check the chat whenever John is talking, because I can do both at the same time, because I had to call in from my phone today. So um, just bear with us if, if the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but anyway, we're going to proceed as, as planned for the moment and just let us know if there's a, if there's a difficulty hearing. So today's uh, Q&A, which is Macintosh's Candle in the Darkness, uh, it's part of a series called The Great Shift. Uh, you know, what's really going on? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And um, there's a series that we've done. I think this might be number 11 or 12, lost count. 12. If you want to check out, oh, it's 12. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, if you want to check out the replays, please go to John's, um, the link that he's going to pop up in just a minute, um, check out the, um, to check out the previous broadcasts. And um, if you have any questions about anything that you hear in any of the broadcasts, uh, please email John at globalpeacewell.com. Uh, perhaps your question will be future broadcast. Um, I say my name is Ann Carey Ford. Uh, I I have a website that I'd love to invite you to visit. It's voiceofdivinefeminine.com. I share my own insights about this time that we're in, which we call the shift between paradise. So I think most of you are familiar with John McIntosh. Uh, so I think I'll just bring him on and we'll see what happens. <laughs> John, do you want to say a word before we get into the questions? Yeah, absolutely. We'll uh, we'll see what happens, and um, you know we're involved in uh, a lot of uh, you could call it chaos or turmoil uh, going on in the world right now, and and um, this affects the electromagnetic frequency around the planet. So glitches um, that resonate with electromagnetism uh, can occur anywhere at any time, uh, and this includes in the body. So. Um, if, uh, if things go a little wonky uh, today, uh, no concern. Uh, the main focus is uh, what you feel in the heart, not so much what the words spoken um, have to do with, although we do like to focus on objects. Um, the theme today, uh, which uh, came to me, is um, a candle in the darkness, and uh, it, it refers specifically uh, to the intensifying chaotic energy of the collapse of the divine masculine dysfunctional patriarchy that is occurring as we speak. We could arguably reference it towards the American election, which uh, is stirring up the, the beehive of what uh, many refer to as the elite or the Illuminati or the deep state um, uh, who are, are now uh, threatened in a very significant way as the collapse of the patriarchy occurs um, and its inevitable uh, shift into the neutral phase of the age of light. doesn't matter what occurs, that's what's going to happen uh, for the next few thousand years. Um, but uh, during this phase, it can look like everything is falling apart. Well, in, in, in reality, it is. And I've talked about this many times. The house of cards is falling apart. Uh, so it can be very frightening or scary. And there's a tendency, particularly for the kinds of people that are probably viewing this broadcast live or, or uh, as a replay, uh, to want to fix it or want to influence it in some way. Now, as a sidebar, let's just look very clearly, as I refer to it often, to the fact that what we are in, including what you're looking at right now, a body called John McIntosh, 
um, and a green screen behind and your computer screen and peripherally, whatever you can see in your room or wherever you happen to be. Um, that's your world. That's your universe. That's the only world universe that ex that exists, seems to exist in your life right now. The rest is just a memory. Um, it's very chaotic and it's a dream. So whatever it is that you, let's speak specifically about you, but generically as well, try to do, so-called do, you're not really the doer, but let's say try to do, um, is readjusting in some way the dream. It's thought that creates the dream, and it's not a creation really, because creation is eternal. It's a manifestation or a projection of a dream, and it can be influenced by thought. Thought manifested it, and thought can shift it from one way to the other. So the idea of fixing something um, or improving something, your life, uh, the world scenario, um, various uh, ideas that seem to be screwed up, um, all of this is just, and I like to, to say, and you probably heard this before, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and hoping the, the ship won't sink. Um, it's inevitable where the world is headed, and that is into a phase of neutrality, of peace. Um, and that too is temporary because then it'll move into uh, the divine feminine predominantly, and the, ultimately that'll be dysfunctional uh, because it's a dream. And that's what happens in the manifestation of the universe, which is based on opposites, which emanates from the belief in separation. And it's the only way that manifestation can occur. You have to have it from here to there. I know this is a broken record. I've said it many times before, but sometimes you have to hear it a thousand times before you get it. You meaning anyone. So uh, in my article today, um, I, uh, the title was Meditation on Peace. And some of you may be familiar with a project, an experiment that was done a number of years ago. I think it was by uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation at the time, in Washington, I believe it was. Um, and I think it was a few hundred thousand people were meditating for a, a prolonged period of time, perhaps uh, a weekend retreat or something like that, on peace. And there was a monitorable gauge uh, that, that showed definitively that crime reduced for a period of, of clock time uh, during and, and, and slightly after uh, that experiment occurred. <clears throat> so it was obvious, and this has been duplicated in many other places around the world subsequently in different ways. Uh, so there's no question that the, the dream can be shifted uh, demonstrably in a way that you can, you can uh, monitor um, through the use of thought. And that occurs also uh, with so-called negative thought. Um, and um, so for people that are still in the phase of what I call the, the second level of awakening, where you know in your mind mentally that this is a dream, but you haven't experienced it in the heart or through the self yet as, a, as an absolute knowing, uh, there is a tendency because of conditioning, because of the attachments, expectations, and, and identifications that, that still hide the self from the self, that you can, in some way, fix the dream, save others, improve uh, the world, this kind of thing. Notwithstanding the fact that everything is predestined until you make the no matter what choice to be free. Um, it can seem like that's actually happening because you can see results, even if they're temporary. And um, uh, anyone that's teaching self-development will, will tell you, uh, you know, that, that thought builds. They'll say creating your own reality. It's actually manifesting uh, your own experience, which is a temporary thing. It's a dream within the dream. And there are many levels of dreams within dreams. So the reason I'm mentioning this is is first of all because doing this, so-called doing this, this, this focused attention, um, which you could call a candle in the darkness, focusing on peace by whatever name or names, um, it does have a so-called positive influence. This can be focusing on uh, another person's uh, health, 
uh, long distance uh, healing, I, I believe is, is one of the terms that people use for this. It does not change the conditioning underlying the, the um, effect that the conditioning causes, which is, is dispeace, uh, chaos, uh, uh, chaotic circumstances, uh, uh, health situations, challenges in life, uh, divorces, uh, loss of financial security, loss of job, loss of status, thousands of different possibilities that emanate from uh, conditioning. Uh, it does not change that. The conditioning has to dissolve uh, in order for um, the, the circumstances to be altered. But it can do it temporarily. It can have that appearance. So there's nothing wrong with that except, and this is the caveat that I'm leading up to, uh, that there is a tendency to feel that you know better than the rest of the world, so-called. That you are perhaps even special. You have special abilities. There is a subtle spiritual arrogance, which is far more insidious than uh, a normal, so-called normal personality arrogance. It's far more insidious and harder to see. So... I don't like to use the word there's a danger. Uh, this is this is just simply part of the unfolding of the dream uh, towards the eventual and full awakening to the self that you are. But this is something to look at, that when you are trying to fix the world, fix another person, fix a situation, um, there is a tendency to come from arrogance, come from specialness, um, and uh, and feel that you are separate. You're, be you're better than. So this is something to look at. Now, let's look at, at the, the concept of meditation on peace itself. If your focus is generic, instead of looking at a situation such as the chaos that's going on, pick anything. There are many different scenarios going on around the world right now, chaos, um, as a result of um, uh, the shift and the, and the collapse of the dysfunctional patriarchy. Um, if your attention is generic, simply on peace, without giving it a definition, then what you're doing is you are so-called doing, you're never the doer, the self is the doer, you're the conduit. Um, you are so-called doing, you are focused on the revelation of, the exposure of, the self to itself, meaning you, in capital letters, you as the self, becoming aware of the self. And this is an aspect of surrender. And surrender is the flip side of the coin of, of self-inquiry. Only self-inquiry and or, ideally both, surrender, total surrender, total genuine, sincere surrender, absolutely, no matter what. This is the only way. Uh, to realize who you are. And all practices, all disciplines eventually dovetail uh, into either self-inquiry or surrender or both. Uh, that's the end of all practices because they dissolve the conditioning, which are the clouds that hide the sun of the self that you are. So if your attention is on peace generically, then what you're doing is you this so-called you or in parenthesis me, the, the false self-identity, is getting out of the way of the flow of truth through itself. Now, what does that mean? Well, you are truth. That's another name for the self. And there is a flow of the energy, if you like, the emanation of truth that is generally impeded or reduced or conflicted by one's conditioning. Conditioning, to get back to what I started with, can include, does include, the idea that I know better than, what's, than others in the world. I know what's wrong and, and I can fix it and I'm special. This may not be said overtly um, uh, in a conscious way that you recognize, or it might be. Um, you know, I have special abilities, so some people will just come out and say that. Uh, no, you don't. You're the self, period. That's it. You're perfect. You're not any different than anybody else, and there are no others. It's only the self. 
uh, the body is not who you are. That's just an instrument, no matter how attached you might be to it. That attachment is part of conditioning. So if your attention is on peace generically, then you are focused generically on the truth. And this ultimately leads to, sounds like a time space thing, but ultimately reveals the self that you are. And one standing in the full awareness of the self the God, the I am, the consciousness that they are, has more influence on the dream, the grand dream, which let's call it the world situation, than seven and a half billion people that are well-meaning. One, just one. Uh, it's an enormous influence. You, it, it's comparing a grain of sand uh, to uh, a galaxy, uh, the difference in the influence of one standing in truth. This is where to place one's attention. And if that doesn't feel like it resonates with you and you want to fix the world, then that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That just happens to be where you're at. And there is certainly nothing wrong with, with so-called sending energy or sending light or sending healing thoughts or vibrations to others, you know, in the next room or on the other side of the planet. Nothing wrong with this at all. But it's not as so-called effective as focusing your peace attention on truth generically without reference to what seems to be happening, which is just a dream. So that's what I wanted to talk about uh, as a preamble. And now we can go to the questions. Okay. So the first question, Jerry, who wants to know how does food, whether healthy or unhealthy, figure into the equation? If I'm already perfection itself, isn't what I consume irrelevant? This may very well be one of the top 10 questions that spiritually oriented people have at some point. They may have it on a regular basis. And uh, we know that there are a lot of people that are involved in uh, uh, such uh, uh, subjects as veganism or vegetarianism, um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, they may tie it into yoga. They may tie it into macrobiotics. Um, there could be all kinds of nutritional studies uh, oriented to it. Um, and this is fine. If, if it, as I've always said, if you, if you um, filter this through... Um, uh, the joy uh, that you are, uh, and it resonates, then that's where you're supposed to be in the moment. However, let's emphasize the fact that the body itself is not you. Uh, and it's a dream, and it's certainly not perfect. Um, it's very imperfect because it, it uh, exists within the realm of the world of opposites, which is always in some level of chaos. Right now, great chaos. Uh, great, great meaning considerable. Um, it's not perfect. And no matter what you do to it, it's not going to be perfect because it is made up out of conditioning. Wouldn't exist if we didn't have this belief in separation. So it's not you. It's an instrument. But most people identify who they believe they are as a body, mind, identity, or me, or personality, or person. And this is, this is who the vast majority of, of so-called people believe they are. Well, you're not a person. You are the self, and you are shining your light through a, a prism on the screen of consciousness, which is another name for you. And it looks like you are split into infinite parts, which you can call people, which have bodies and minds that vary uh, extensively. All of them are you. There's no exception. Everything is you. And this is not just your body. This is other body. So to, to get to the point, the body itself has its own destiny based on conditioning. And even if you were all of a sudden fully aware, call it self-realized, and knew that you are the self and chose to remain in a body instead of uh, departing, as many do, uh, the body can still go on to have uh, and does have its own destiny, 
which in most cases uh, involves aging and uh, debility and uh, illnesses and, and uh, sometimes significant illnesses and accidents and, and things of this sort. It's not you, it's just your instrument, which has been sculpted out of the condition you came in with, which presumably has been dissolved in order for you to be fully realized as one who is aware that they are the one self. Then the body and the world and everything in the universe becomes a garment, doesn't become, you become aware of the fact that it's a garment that you're wearing. Uh, you can call it you uh, because clearly there is only one, so it has to in some way be you on a temporary basis, but it's not something that you are attached to as most so-called people are attached to the body and to the mind and to uh, their identities, whatever they happen to be. So whatever is supposed to happen with the body is going to happen. This means that, and only if you resonate with this, if you feel joyful about this, this means you don't have to, and there are no have tos really, you don't have to concern yourself with what to eat. And um, I believe it was Jesus said, don't uh, take no thought for where you live, uh, what you'll wear, or what you'll eat. In the hour of your need, it'll be given to you. And this is absolutely true in the hour of your need. So if the body would function in the way it's supposed to function as part of its destiny, which might be, you know, a perfectly formed body that, that feels exquisitely healthy and energetic, um, most or all of the time, uh, whatever the outcome is of that particular uh, body scenario, uh, the food intake, and this includes water uh, and air, and some will call it prana, life force, um, it will be shown to you in the moment. So just to give you an example, let's say there's some kind of a food, maybe a, a sugary, sweet, fattening food that, that everybody that knows about nutrition will tell you is just poison, there might be a moment when that is exactly what you should have. And you just simply have it. And then the next moment or the next, uh, let's say, call it a clock day, uh, you think, oh my God, I can't even imagine ever eating that again. Or why did I eat that? Uh, that could come. But in the moment, if something comes to you, something you've never had before, uh, and, and you end up taking it in or, or, or looking for it or adding it to your diet um, uh, for a day, a month, a year, perhaps the rest of your life, then you're listening to the voice of the self, which is the real you, which is it, it's guiding itself, not guiding you. There is no separate you that has a self or a higher self or a soul or any of that nonsense, no matter how wonderful it sounds, there is only the self talking to itself and mostly not being listened to um, uh, or being listened to with, with uh, adjustments because of uh, this nonsense about free will. There is no free will, um, only the dream of free will. So when you are listening to the self and following the self regarding food, it will tell you precisely what to eat, when to eat it, even how to prepare it. There's no concern about it at all. Uh, and it may very well be that it's vegan. It may very well be uh, that it is, uh, um, uh, let's say, free range if, if you're not involved in, in um, uh, veganism or vegetarianism. Um, it may very well be uh, uh, very carefully grown, uh, but it may not be. Uh, it, it may have come from uh, whatever that company is that uh, engineers uh, seeds and that sort of thing. You don't need to be concerned about this. The self has your back, has its back. It's not something that you need to put attention on except to just simply not resist. And when you don't resist, suffering dissolves and everything just flows. It's as simple as that. Okay. Right. So the next is Thomas, who wants to know when I awake, 
wake in the night, focusing on silence and feeling very spacious. Recently, I've been experiencing bouts of extreme anxiety and emotional upset over the slightest things, which is then followed by self-judgment. Is there to not be so affected by these emotional storms? Okay. We had a little choppiness in the in that question. Um, basically, the person is saying they're they're awakening in in the night. They're focusing on uh, silence. Uh, they're uh, experiencing some choppiness uh, and um, uh, storms, um, and uh, in some cases, they're uh, they're feeling um, guilty or or judging themselves. When you are involved in a conscious focus to be free, to remember the freedom that you are. You don't become free. You are already free. It's just a revelation of who you actually are. Um, there will be a shift, and this is what we talk about, the great shift. There will be a shift in the way your life unfolds, which in some cases is dramatically different than the way it's unfolded up until now. And this can, and usually is, filled with a lot of triggers. And those triggers can come um, in a moment to moment uh, life while you're um, so-called walking around uh, during the day, or you can wake up uh, in, in the night, perhaps repeatedly, perhaps uh, continuously with all kinds of anomalies uh, that are upsetting. Uh, they can be physical, they can be emotional, they can be mental. And, and it also can bring on the feeling of I've done something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Um, I've done something wrong. Um, these are the triggers that you have allowed to show up because now you're stepping off the wheel of destiny um, and although you still have a, one destiny, and that is to remember that you are God, that you are the self, um, you're on the so-called fast track. You're going as the crow flies instead of in a zigzag pattern, as I say often. And, and so whatever is ready next in terms of conditioning to be recognized, to come up and, and for you to see, and to then dissolve, you're not doing the dissolving. Grace, which is love and action, does the dissolving because you are either surrendered to it, saying yes to what is, or you are using self-inquiry, who am I, or you're doing both. And um, this can be like a machine gun. You can do one after the other. Many, many things can happen. You can go into all kinds of crazy uh, physical uh, scenarios that, that uh, make no sense at all. You can go into panic attacks. You can... You can uh, uh, have meltdowns of, of self-doubt and self-judgment. All of these things are not who you are. They're on the stage of who you used to believe you are or were. Are, um, and you are in the audience watching them and knowing that's not me. But it's still, in a way, tethered, attached to you. And so in order for that layer of conditioning, whatever it may manifest as, such as a panic attack or such as a self-judgment, um, you allow that to be filtered through either surrender and or self-inquiry, who am I? And it recedes back into the self and dissolves, that layer of it. So uh, I encourage you to do what you've probably heard many times before, just go with the flow of what's manifesting probably very, very quickly and sometimes very dramatically, maybe in spikes where many things happen, then nothing. Um, and allow the, the doingness of it to be taken care of for you. You just simply stay out of the way, say yes to it. And if you're inclined to use self-inquiry, who am I then even better? Cause that's very, very quick. Um, so all is well. Um, it's wonderful. It feels like crap <laughs> uh, when you're going through this, but I can assure you that it leads to uh, very quickly leads to the awareness of, of who you really are on a permanent basis.
The next question is from Diane, who wants to know what remains in our DNA because of what transpired in the past. I know that our physical bodies are only a shell that we use while we incarnate. However, when we totally surrender and let go and the knowing of our true self, do we still have residue in our DNA from our belief systems, conditioning, etc., that also needs to be dealt with? Does the surrendering wash all that away and we never have to think or deal with it again? Okay, this is a extremely good question, but let's just get back to the idea, the truth that the body, which includes obviously the DNA, is not who you are. Um, does it, does that dream, because that's what it is, it's a solidified dream, or it seems to be solidified dream, uh, does it contain something called DNA that seems to be an archive, like a like a library of information with regard to all your so-called lifetimes, which are also dreams, all reincarnation is a dream as well, dream within a dream. Uh, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, as of course in Miracle says, and can a lifetime be threatened? Can several lifetimes, reincarnations, be threatened? Well, of course it can, they're, they're, they have a beginning and an end, so they're not real, they're dreams. But are they happening within the dream? Yes, they're happening within the dream. Uh, does the DNA contain an archive of everything that you have so-called quote unquote done. Once again, you're not the doer. Um, uh, through all of those incarnations, yes, it absolutely does. And um, is that labeled by, defined by the term, as I like to call it, instead of karma, conditioning, attachments, expectations, and um, identifications tied to memory and imagination? Yes, it is. And that's the only thing uh, that you need to look at. You don't need to give all kinds of labels uh, to it or all kinds of subcategories to it. It's just simply conditioning. And does it stay with you um, until you are aware of who you are? Yes, it does. In fact, uh, when you are what I call free with baggage, and that is when you are aware through the heart, through the self, that the dream, the world, the universe, your life experience, your body is a dream, not mentally, but through the heart, it's a knowing. Then you've stepped off the stage, and I've said this many times before, but it's related to this subject, so I'll say it again. You've stepped off the stage, you're probably in the front row of the theater, and you're watching the play of the dream, which includes your body and its relationship to the circumstances in the world. Um, knowing that it's a dream, but pulled back into the dream frequently because the conditioning is still significant. I call that freedom with baggage. And as you continue your focus, ideally with self-inquiry and, and surrender, and this question had to do with surrender, uh, it, it could be just simply surrendered. That's the, the, the pathless path that I took when I jumped off the cliff January 5th, uh, 1999. Uh, was surrender. I knew nothing about self-inquiry at that point. Um, I, I just simply surrendered to whatever. I called it freedom, uh, 100%, no matter what. Does that dissolve um, the conditioning? Yes, it does. And how does it do that? Well, where your attention flows, experience follows. And this is within the dream, they say what you think about, uh, uh, you, you create. You create your reality through your thought. Um, you don't create your reality through thought because reality is eternal. You don't create because creation is eternal. You manifest your experience through your thought, which is conditioning. Uh, but it's not a creation and it's not re real. It's a dream. Um, and that's a fine distinction, but it's a major one. So. What's happening as you are surrendering is you are allowing what is, whatever comes up as a result of the conditioning that you have remaining, you're allowing it to be. You're not resisting it. And if you're not resisting it, you're not suffering. You cannot suffer if you do not resist what is because you've let the idea of, of victims go. You still can have lots of pain and lots of chaos, but that doesn't mean you're suffering. It's just inconvenient. Um, so 
this in itself has your attention on who you really are. You can call that peace. I called it freedom. You can call it beauty or love. Uh, you can call it uh, a peace. Um, you can call it uh, truth. Whatever name resonates with you or names that resonate with you, you're focused on that. And that is what is expanding in your experience. You don't have to know what peace really is. You can make a big list of it, but that's all mental. And it's always loaded with conditioning. So it's not true. Some of it might seem true, might be beautiful, but the truth is only known when you are totally self-realized, when you are aware of the self that you are. So you don't have to know what peace really is, what freedom really is. It's, it's just the sincere, humble choice, call it a desire, to experience freedom. And what you're doing is placing your attention on the truth. And if you, for example, if you pull the plug on your laptop, you know that it will continue to function depending on how good a, a laptop you have for an hour, two hours, 10 hours, maybe, maybe a day. I don't know. Uh, but it'll continue to function until a battery goes dead. This is exactly what happens with regard to conditioning when you're in the surrender mode, when you've chosen surrender, perhaps instead of, as I did, instead of self-inquiry, which as I said, I, I wasn't aware of until just a few years ago. Uh, long after I was free, I became aware of it. So uh, in that regard, the conditioning will still continue to manifest just the same as if you take your foot off of the accelerator, the car will continue to move forward until, um, un until the, the, the energy of momentum um, uh, finally stops the car. And uh, as a, as a result of that, the, 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 conditioning that was the acceleration um, uh, burns itself out because there's no longer any attention given to it. Your foot's not on the accelerator. Your attention is not on the conditioning. It's on the truth or on peace. And so you get what you focus your attention on. It's as simple as that. Place your attention on truth and it will expand. Place it on chaos. Place it on drama. Place it on stories. And that's what you'll get. It's that simple. That's how surrender works. So hopefully that uh, answers the question for you. The next question is from Judith, who wants to know, I'm reading your book, Master of the New, and in the chapter called Humanity as Light, it says, in the enlightened state of consciousness, genuine freedom, we play with and within light's temporary flow of manifested experiences. We so-called travel at the speed of thought. You can be in several so-called places consciously in one moment and, experiencing, and experience them both separately and as one whole. There is no distance in pure consciousness. You can be the light of balance in the midst of chaos between two people or between nations. Could you please elaborate more on how these experiences really happen? Uh, okay, let's just first of all deal with the word how. Um, how is always a question that the false self has. It, it, it wants to feel safe, and so it wants to know what the parameters of the ways and means um, uh, function. Um, how is not the concern of truth. Um, spontaneity um, is the norm uh, when you are living uh, in the moment um, as the self, or you're focused on uh, recalling, becoming fully aware of the self, uh, the how is irrelevant. Uh, nevertheless, um, we can dance around it. Um, as and I've said many times, you can't put a frame around infinity, but we can dance around it a wee bit. So uh, with regard to um, uh, traveling at the speed of thought, let's just look at what's actually happening. When you are aware that you're one, which is the truth, one has no dimensions. One has no distance. One has no time. So you're not really traveling. Traveling in the sense that I wrote it in, in that particular book 
refers to awareness. You're aware of what's going on anywhere that you place your attention. And your attention could be on, let's say, two people. For example, you're watching this um, broadcast and uh, between screens, both Anne and I may be on at the same time. Your awareness is looking at one screen, but it's split. And there's two people that are thousands of miles apart, but not. Uh, certainly in the, in the physical world, uh, you could say, well, I can measure it right down to the, 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 the tiniest uh, uh, part uh, and tell you exactly how far apart you are. That's just a dream. It's not real. Yes, but it takes you this many hours to get there if you walk or if you take a bicycle, or you take a car, or if you take an airplane. Um, and so there must be distance. This is just a dream. And we bought into it so thoroughly that we believe it. But when you are aware of the fact, the truth, that you are one, you're aware that there is no such thing as time or space. You are one, not with, that's separation. The idea of with is joining of something. You are aware of as yourself. You're aware of one as yourself. You're aware of everything that seems to be separated within one, everything that's projected on the screen of separation, the screen of consciousness, I should say, as one, appearing as many and appearing at a distance, which involves time uh, to uh, circumnavigate uh, from one part of the galaxy to another or one universe to another. It appears that way, but it's just an appearance. It's not real. So when you are aware of the self, as I am, I know that I am you. I don't see you right now, but I can feel you and whoever's watching this, um, wherever you are and whenever you are. Let's say this is watched 20 years from today. It's still now and it's still me because you and I are one. Your computer your uh, the electromagnetism that's making it function the video uh, that somehow is uh, intermingled in the in the mixture uh, all of it is one as the self so this is not really explaining how it's it's explaining what is going on the self is aware of itself wherever it places its attention um, it, it's aware of it um, and uh, uh, this is the norm uh, it's completely different than, than how we function in the world uh, uh, when we're dreaming. Uh, but this is the truth of what's actually going on. And in truth, you're aware of an illusion because it's not happening. It's not there. I don't get into that so much because uh, one can become very cavalier, very blasé, very cold and indifferent to um, perhaps the so-called suffering of others or of the world. Uh, when they say nothing's happening, so what's the point? Uh, the point is love is always the point. Love is always at the heart of everything. Uh, so dream or no dream, happening or not happening, uh, the extension of the love you are to the love you are is always at the core. And, um, and so I don't uh, give too much emphasis to the fact that it, it, it isn't happening, but I don't give too much emphasis to it because of that uh, caveat. Next question from Kim, who wants to know, what does he self mean? Is it an agreement with my body? Is it something else? What do ailments or sickness mean? I do know my physical condition has helped me leaps and bounds toward freedom. If I'm done with that need for an ailment, can I just let it go? Um, okay, the, the, uh, the question was asked, uh, and it was a little choppy, what does healing mean? healing mean. Uh, we're talking about sickness of the body and, and healing of the body. Well, whatever happens to the body, for example, we were talking before about a very so-called very healthy body full of energy, um, beautiful physique, perhaps beautiful to look at, uh, perhaps uh, ever young um, uh, for many, many years, um, or uh, more than likely, uh, a body that has uh, quite a number of uh, uh, little uh, dog-eared uh, pages to it. 
uh, as most of us have experienced. And there could be hundreds and hundreds of different scenarios from, you know, a hangnail to uh, chronic pain that's always present. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, so-called life-threatening disease. There is no such thing as life-threatening disease because your life can't be threatened. The body uh, can depart, but you can't die. The identity can most definitely die, but you're not the identity. So death is just the illusion of the dream. You are never born and you never die. You are God. You are the self. You are the I am. You are consciousness. You're never born. You never die. Death is an illusion. Birth is an illusion. Um, it's just uh, entering into a dream that comes and goes, and we call that life and, and death. And within it, we call it um, decay, um, growth and decay, for example. So conditioning, the conditioning, which I constantly harp on, attachments, expectations, and, and identifications, is what causes shifts or changes to the body and to the circumstances that affect the body's experience. So if you have um, some kind of illness, and it could be a simple thing like the flu, which, by the way, <laughs> in case you haven't heard, the CDC has downgraded COVID. If you're not familiar with this, it came out and the media is not promoting it. This is still within the dream. Uh, to less than a flu. Hardly anybody is aware of this, but uh, less than 10 days ago, they downgraded it to a, a flu, and it was always at that level. The information has been completely um, uh, erroneous. Uh, we, we don't get into the story on, on any of my writings or broadcasts, but uh, just for your information so that you know that's what's actually happening. Uh, dream happening. So the conditioning is what causes, let's say, the flu. And the flu will have many manifestations. All of them dovetail backwards, you could say, into a specific conditioning that is designed by the self to get your attention on something that's ready to dissolve. And we may, and often do, get the same kind of trigger that occurs very often through the body, perhaps through repeated episodes of the same kind of illness, in order to get our attention. And it may take hundreds of those. So when you, let's say you meaning anyone, goes to a so-called healer, whether it's allopathic drugs and surgery or whether it's natural or, or whatever the ways and means may be, even self-healing. Uh, and it seems to have an influence or effect, perhaps a total reversal of the conditions, unless the conditioning under which this occurred has dissolved, it will come back somehow, some way, perhaps the same way, perhaps in a totally different way. So all healing is superficial. None of it is real unless it's working in concert with the dissolving of the conditioning. And you may very well be involved in self-inquiry, which is definitely dissolving conditioning. And it may or may not affect the destiny of the body. You may still have this so-called sickness, a chronic illness, perhaps a life-threatening, so-called life-threatening illness. But you, the real you, are becoming more and more aware as the clouds of conditioning dissolve and the sun becomes more and more apparent as who you really are and has never not been you. Um, this is so-called happening, uh, but the body may not work in concert with it in terms of what happens to it. Um, it may not get healed, may not get well. or it may be completely healed. It has a separate destiny. It's tied to old conditioning. But what you're so-called doing uh, to become aware of who you really are um, may or may not affect the healing of the body. That's the only thing that really matters is the, the desolation of the conditioning. 
and what happens to the body is irrelevant. Naturally, we want to feel comfortable. Uh, we'd like to be happy. We'd like to have energy. We'd like to sleep well. We'd like to be pain free. And uh, we can certainly place attention on those things. But the conditioning is what's going to manifest, what's going to happen to your body. And there's nothing you can do about that. Um, but you most definitely, and you don't do anyway, uh, you most definitely uh, it can focus your attention on the desolation of uh, the conditioning that's keeping you in the bondage of a dream, including the dream body. That may not be exactly what you want to hear, um, uh, but uh, it's actually what's happening. Question is anonymous. Um, I have seven children, and my love for them and witnessing their suffering has been the driving force for my quest. I have a daughter who has been a meth and heroin addict since she was 13. She is now 26. I see so many reflections of myself, my conditioning and suffering in my children. It feels and looks like it is what I am, not what I am not. I have been doing the work of myself and hopes this will change my nightmare into a dream that gets better for all. I think she just wants some counsel on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I certainly, my heart goes out to um, the many that are in uh, circumstances of this kind. This, this can be incredibly challenging um, and, um, and heart-wrenching. But, of course, a broken heart is an open heart, uh, especially if you don't try to patch it up. You just allow it to break. Um, I know that can be very difficult, but it's part of the desolation of conditioning. One thing for certain is that you hold no responsibility, whatever, for what's going on in another person's life experience. The, the idea of guilt, shame, and remorse and unworthiness are at the foundation of all conditioning and none of it's real, but it feels very, very real. So guilt can be a, an enormous influence on a person's life and can make them so-called make them do all kinds of things they, they wouldn't normally do. But be assured you are not responsible for what's going on. That's their conditioning. Remembering that all is one and you are that, that one, but let's just look at, at the, appearance of two separate aspects of oneness, the daughter who um, has a manifestation of her own conditioning uh, occurring is not your responsibility. Now, could you have in a previous lifetime or lifetimes in some way contributed? Maybe you were a drug pusher in a previous lifetime. And, uh, and now you get to see what the results are of that. Your conditioning is to experience, to see, to live through the agony of this relationship and watching a loved one uh, destroy themselves, seemingly destroy themselves. You can't destroy the self, not a possibility. Just like you can't lose the soul, there's no such thing. Uh, there is only the self and it's perfect and it's indestructible, it's never born, never dies. But there sure is the appearance of the destruction of the self when you believe in the body mind identity as a person as a as a, a individual identity and there is definitely the experience the feeling of incredible agony uh, when it's someone that that you so-called love uh, despite the fact that all is love um, and and this is your opportunity to allow the conditioning to to be dissolved to to be um, dissipated to, to um, no longer um, uh, influence uh, your life experience. And this is done through surrender, most likely in the situation, unless you're aware of self-inquiry and you resonate with it, you surrender to the situation. You say yes to it. You don't like it, but you know what's happening. So you surrender to it. You extend your love to the extent that you understand what love is to, to the, the greatest extent that you're able to extend it um, uh, to that individual. You certainly don't allow yourself to be abused or used, um, but you do what you are guided to do to the extent that you're listening and you will be told precisely what to do. This so-called you is just the self 
counseling the self. And that might involve departing from that soul. And when I say soul, I'm talking about the self. I'm not referring to it as the soul as a separate entity, that being. Um, or it might be that you'll be a caretaker for that uh, being, a daughter uh, in this case, for the rest of, of the physical experience. It's whatever the destiny is. But most definitely, you are not responsible. You have your own conditioning and your own life experience, and that experience is including the experience with that very, very difficult situation, which is an enormous trigger and therefore a, a divine blessing, disguised opportunity for you to dissolve or have dissolved the conditioning related to that scenario. And this happens through surrender or it happens through self-inquiry, ideally both. Um, that's where to place your attention. And, and if you are resonating uh, with uh, complete freedom, then I most definitely encourage both self-inquiry and surrender in this situation. And you will see major shifts in your awareness, perhaps not your circumstances, because that's a destiny, uh, the body's destiny, yours and hers. But you will most definitely find a kind of peace which expands in the midst of the agony of the scenario. This cannot be explained. I, I can only dance around it, but the truth cannot be explained. It's just simply what occurs when you become more and more aware of who you are as a result of the desolation of conditioning, which is occurring in a very dramatic way in this particular scenario. And, and to emphasize this, because this will be the last question, um, when your life is filled with a lot of triggers, a lot of, let's call it chaos and conflict, which we can call what it really is, is triggers, uh, then clearly you have on some level made the choice to be free. And you are capable, you are able, sufficiently aware is what that means, to shift through the desolation of the conditioning in the midst of the chaos. And so this is an indication of, very clear indication, that you are on the fast track. Your life might look like hell, but you're on the fast track if you just go with the flow of it through surrender and or self-inquiry. You'll find that that so-called peace that passes understanding begins to come from behind the clouds. Even if you stay in that for the rest of, of the so-called lifetime of the body, you will feel a sense of peace that expands because you're becoming more aware of who you really are. So it's a blessing. I know it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't feel like it. But it's definitely an enormous blessing. And this is how the self wakes itself up. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time together today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And once again, if you have a question, you're watching the replay or a replay of one of the previous shows, email john at globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. And uh, we'll be here next week, we think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for hanging in with the little glitches that we had. And thank you so much, Ann, for your uh, invaluable a contribution to this uh, a little experience that we're sharing with uh, those that it resonates with. And uh, uh, peace be with everyone. There it is. <laughs> peace be with everyone uh, during this next week. Lots of love. Bye for now. <laughs>